Hello to our village of warriors and our community. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Selma Bartholomew, affectionately known as Dr. B. If you are new to Legacy Ed News, welcome. And if you are part of our community of warriors, welcome back. Excited to have this time with you. Um, I hope you had a good uh, Mother's Day weekend and cheers to you and keep celebrating. It's not just for one day, okay? Keep honoring yourself. I'm always reminding uh, my educators and my teachers and families to uh, pour a cup of compassion and sip it slow. So don't just uh, celebrate on one day and you don't have to over celebrate. I don't mean go on a shopping spree or those things and buy things that we can't afford. What I really mean is find those things that bring you joy, those quiet things, a quiet moment to journal, a cup of tea in the morning, those things that show yourself kindness as we move forward in this world. So I'm excited to um, have this opportunity to, for another episode of Legacy Ed News. I relaunched in April, so thank you so much for all of the support. And um, I'm inviting you, if you've not seen the first episode I talked about in Local Parenthes, please do. And um, my last episode was on uh, this issue of guardians or risk and teachers carrying guns in schools and being um, approved by legislation to carry guns. And I also highlighted a community in Hartford, uh, Connecticut, who have um, now formed a self-defense brigade in order to address the violence in their communities. And as I shared, I want to say to you, this is a series that I'm doing, and I'm going to a place with you. So stay with me in this conversation, please, as we engage. And so today's topic, ready for it. I'm gonna talk about the cannabis and schooling and the impact on our children and on our families and on our community. That's right. I'm talking about the weed today. And um, I wanna to get to a brave conversation with you. It's not something to take lightly to be quite honest. And so I wanna have a brave conversation with you. So normally I'm reporting out on a particular news issue and kind of making and connecting those dots. I'm gonna take a moment today, I'm kind of sitting back, but I wanna lean in with you. So I'm hoping you lean in with me in this conversation and this very brave conversation about the impact of cannabis in schooling within our, within our schools and within our community. And then yes, on the next Legacy Ed News, um, I definitely wanna join, want you to join me. And I might actually do it as a webinar. I haven't decided yet because as you know, I'm also an entrepreneur and a founder, and um, I always am mindful of the fact that we wear many hats as entrepreneurs, and especially as Black entrepreneurs, people sometimes put stickers on those hats. So I'm always showing myself compassion in terms of trying to build this community of engagement. It's not easy, people. So just so you know that, it is so not easy. When you see things, sometimes you think, oh, they woke up like this. No, Beyonce did not wake up like this. She's got a full team behind her, okay? So I appreciate the love and the support. So let's get into it. I want to talk about cannabis and schooling, and I want to also offer some a historical context to this conversation, to this very brave conversation. And it might make, it's gonna make some people feel uncomfortable what I'm about ready to say and what I'm about ready to talk about. But that's okay because when you're uncomfortable, you grow. And if you just stay in a place of comfort, you won't grow. And that's not what legacy and that's not what myself and my team, that's not the work that we're engaged in. We wanna have uncomfortable conversations and we wanna have them in a brave space. So this question of um, cannabis in schools is a big one. Um, we have had nationwide legislation around um, the legalization of cannabis, right? And so first of all, there might be this mindset from people that people are not being arrested and that um, the decriminalization of, um, of, of marijuana and of, and of cannabis, um, don't be fooled, people. First of all, each state has different legislations. And so, for example, in a state like Oregon, it's fully legal, including the medicinal use of it. And they have categorized themselves in Oregon as a decriminalization state. That's not the same in states like Idaho and Wyoming and Kansas and South Carolina, where it is still fully illegal. 
fully illegal, so not even for medicinal purposes. Then you have Nebraska where it's fully illegal, but they claim that they are decriminalizing it, right? I told you, let's get into this discussion. And then you've got a state like Texas, which has mixed legislation. And so when we look at the uh, Federal, Bureau of Invest Federal Bureau of Investigations, their crime statistics, they only release them for, so we were in 2024, they haven't released 2023 yet, but in 2022, they had more than two, uh, 200, almost 250,000, a quarter of a million arrests associated with marijuana use. And use is not the same as possession and is not the same as selling, right? So all of these things kind of complicate the, the issue. I don't necessarily know if it complicates the issue for what I want to talk about in the context of schooling. In some ways it does, but I want to get into it, all right? So, so get ready. So we know um, in New York, which is where um, I am, but I work with the schools across the country, this issue of recreational use of marijuana, now I'm going to highlight that word for you. It says recreational use. And there's also medicinal use, right? And so I'm not touching the medicinal use of this. I absolutely have benefited and know the benefits of the medicinal use of marijuana. What I'm talking about is the fact that we have this quote unquote recreational use of marijuana within our school, within our community. And what does it actually look like? How is it actually playing out and the impact on our children and on, um, and on our schools? Well, first of all, the term recreational I don't think people spent a lot of time um, engaging community and engaging our young people and also the adults, the parents around what exactly is recreational use, right? And uh, what we're finding is, hey, you go to bed, mom, dad, auntie, you get up in the morning and if you're reaching for cannabis every single day, that's not recreational use. And so what's happening in our schools is the following. Well, I'm gonna hold on that in a minute, but I'm gonna reflect on um, my generation, yes, and um, share a story in terms of my first introduction to uh, marijuana as a, small, as a child, as a middle schooler. And so here I was in middle school, my friends, we were allowed to go out for lunch and going out to lunch with my friends. And my friend stops in this um, local bodega store and she bought marijuana from the bodega store. Now, yeah, I'm going to, I was the good girl. I was able to say no, not because I was the good girl, but that's really because I was in a household with my mom and dad and they did have conversations with us about not smoking and that this was not our values and they didn't put pressure on us necessarily it was just a brave and a safe space for us to talk right and to you know raise questions about well what if what if you know you get this choice and it wasn't that I was even pressured by my friend but I knew how to say how to say how to say no and as a result in our communities, right? So here is it in our very urban settings. What nobody's really willing to admit and to talk about is before you even legalized recreational marijuana, there were tons of um, brick and mortar <laughs> uh, bodegas and places who were already prevalently pushing the weed in our community, right? So even though it may not have been legal, yes, it was already extremely prevalent in our communities. Now, wait a minute. Don't troll Dr. B and talk about, oh, Dr. B, I'm talking bad about bodega owners. I know fully well that not all bodega owners are the ones selling weeds. I'm just being honest and brave with you about the fact that it was already prevalent. We were already dealing with issues in our schools where kids were coming in as a result of having this easy access to be able to purchase purchase marijuana, they come to school, they're hungry, they got the munchies, they're irritable. So even before this legislation, Legacy and our team working with our teachers, we had to be thinking about strategies on how do we address this? This is before it's even recreational. So I'm always in classrooms. 
I've been in a classroom all of my life. So I'm being honest with you and brave about this, right? And so now here's this legislation around decriminalizing marijuana and decriminalizing it. And I'm gonna talk about why it is important to decriminalize it, but I wanna to get to the question in terms of our community. So let's be honest and brave and say in our communities, it was already prevalent. It was already prevalent and there was never ever any engagement of our young people around why are you, you know, relying on this drug, yes? It was never recreational. Why is it that you were pulling from this drug? What's going on in your life? What tools do you have? So that conversation has never happened and it is not happening even to this day. So it wasn't happening before. And then everyone just wants to play a game of let's pretend, let's pretend. Oh, let's pretend that we can now have, um, you know, recreational marijuana in our communities. So when I was growing up and even um, I think right up until Let's say I don't hear the conversation so much now, but certainly in the 90s and the 2000s, the table conversation and the, the, the presentation and the conversation with parents were moms and dads, right? How are you messaging and talking to your kids about smoking? I mean, we as a community, we did so much work around fighting that image around the nicotine and the Marlboro man that was prevalent in our communities. You would go and you would see it on every billboard. You would see the cigarette ads everywhere. And everyone kind of in our community recognized that smoking was killing our children, generationally impacting our health and our wellness. And the conversation was moms and dads have this conversation with your child about nicotine and the fact that nicotine impacts your ability to pay attention impacts your brain development, right? And how do you have conversations with your kids and talk to them about not smoking? Let's get into it, people. I told you I was going there today. I am having this great conversation. Put a note in the line. Um, how did your parents talk to you about smoking? If you smoke, I'm okay with that, but let me know. How did you get into it? Um, and, and do you want to stop? Is it something that you feel like if I'm okay with smoking, Dr. B? Is it something that you know you want help with? But nicotine is addictive. And we also know that smoking impacts when you're pregnant and you smoke, it impacts that unborn child. We also know, like I said, it impacts brain development. And people would like to think that the brain just stops developing at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. No, it's right up until they're in their 20s, okay? So all of this is things that we need to be mindful of as we talk about the cannabis and the weed that's in our communities and in our, and in our schools. So when did the tables turn now? that we're not having conversations with parents saying, hey, talk to your kids about the fact that they shouldn't be smoking. What we're finding in our schools, and I'm being brave and honest with you and authentic with you is the following. When you're in challenged and complex settings or people are dealing with deep issues, what we're finding is moms and dads are the ones now who need help talking about smoking. And in this case, smoking the weed, right? That they're coming to you if you're a leader and you're dealing with an issue with regards to that child, is that child acting up because they're in a household where they're now um, literally secondhand smoking from marijuana and now they show up, true story, I've got a couple of my schools that we've had to do this, where the clothing is so um, drenched and, and just so overwhelming. Like if you've got a second grader, third grader showing up in a classroom and Every, their entire um, the odor from the marijuana is just right pervasive in the classroom. Now you got to have a washing machine. You got to have an extra uniform. This is a burden on our schools and on our classrooms, right? So we're not going to keep playing this game of let's pretend. That's what not what Dr. B does, and that's not what my team does. We're playing this game of let's pretend. Let's pretend that it's recreational, and let's pretend that people who are dealing with complex social, emotional, financial issues of poverty, whatever it is that they're dealing with, stress, it doesn't have to be poverty of stress, that now it's the parents who are showing up 
with this issue around smoking and the fact that are they even are they able to negotiate the conversations with you that you need to have with them as an educator and as a parent and i'm being honest with you what are the long term effects of cannabis on our children and on their ability to problem solve. And I'm gonna to go to the problem solving piece. Yes, in our work, in our classrooms, as we work with our teachers, we are working to teach teachers how to help kids learn how to actual problem solve. Not how you learned math, but what are the problem solving strategies and how I apply them in my everyday life. And so we need to step back a minute and say, if we're going to say it's recreational, let's not turn a blind eye and pretend that it is recreational for most people. It is not recreational in so many of our communities that are dealing with drug dis issues. And we see the rippling effect, even though people may not want to admit it. Well, if I now am smoking, there's a cost to this. And if I'm struggling financially and I'm not working, now what do you see? You see the rise in larceny, you see the rise in thefts, you see all of these issues that are playing out in our community and everyone wants to play this game of let's pretend that I can make policy and I don't necessarily have to look to see how that policy rolls down the road and impacts our most, um, our most vulnerable, which is our children. So first of all, I'm not saying to you, and, and once again, don't troll Dr. V, I'm not saying to you that, that um, we do not need to decriminalize marijuana and we do not need to decriminalize the massive incarceration of our black men and also our, our women and black and brown people. It, that's an important piece to note um, historically if you're not familiar with Miriam Wright Edelman's work, my hero, one of my heroes and sheroes, actually a, I have a photo of her on my wall, that Miriam Wright Edelman led this march um, of this uh, Children's Defense Fund from the 1960s on. So she was a force behind MLK. She, Ella Baker, the women behind the movement and pushed, right? the JFK with legislation around feeding our children. And then what are the things and the systems that need to be to support our children, children with disabilities. And then she then talks about moves forward in her, you know, powerful body of work where she talks about the school to prison pipeline. And why is it that we're able to pump, you know, able to create a pipeline of students from school uh, to prison and the overclassification of uh, especially our young boys into special education programs, they're not learning. So it's all very much connected people. It's not just that I'm talking about the impact of cannabis. What I'm saying to you is that when our children come to school, if they're in a home environment where they're now you know, literally in the secondhand smoke is no longer even nicotine, but the secondhand smoke is marijuana, is cannabis, right? Why are we not being brave enough as educators to now have this conversation in our schools, in our classrooms, on a district level, on a national level and say, wait a minute, we know we don't want to criminalize you, but we need to now have some more brave conversations with parents and now get to what are the issues that they're dealing with and how do we help you and help you to understand that if you're doing this every single day, it's not recreational, it's now an addiction and it's a hard addiction to break. And so how can we help you to do it? And let's now put out and be honest about the communication that the communication is no longer messaging to your kids that they shouldn't smoke. <laughs> the messaging is now to the adults that they should not be smoking. And if they are, are you smoking in front of your kids? How much of it is it? Is it quote unquote recreational? And what are the impacts? So what we're finding is that the impacts are significant and will have some significant detrimental long-term effects on our children and especially our black and brown children. And it's significant in that if you're a child who has to come to school and you are now, like I mentioned, um, your clothing and everything else is 
um, full of that smell, right? And now you got to navigate those relationships with your colleagues and with your with your classmates. You have a teacher now who's looking at you and know that moms and dads are sending you to school, pervasive of marijuana. What's that relationship going to be? See how I'm leveling how I'm leveling it up. Oh wait, now you have an issue paying attention. That teacher is already struggling, may or may not be struggling as a teacher because they need the pedagogy, which is where come we come in. Like, how do we help you with these complex issues? But we're not in every school, not yet. But now you're in a classroom and that teacher is a new teacher who's struggling with pedagogy and you can't pay attention. You're having a hard time paying attention as a child, right? What are they gonna do? Oh, next you're gonna do what? You're gonna refer him and her to special ed or to and have a referral, oh wait, oh you see now where I'm going. So now you continue to fuel the school to prison pipeline because you're not willing to have the brave conversations about the ripple effects of certain policies and how it shows up at your door as a school principal, as a leader, as our elected officials and our policymakers. So um, let me know what you think about this question of cannabis in our schools. Be brave with Dr. B. Um, share some examples of how you're dealing with it and how you're addressing it. And like I said, I'm not necessarily, I'm not saying to you, you can't use cannabis. I'm not saying to you, I don't want, the, I absolutely have done a lot of research on the criminalization um, you know, of our race, and I understand that. Uh, I don't only work in schools and black and brown schools. So I worked in and have worked in the Midwest and had great conversations with them about the fact, you know what? Your streets look mighty quiet. Where are your young people? Oh, they're in the basement cooking up methane, right? So it's not only um, thinking about our communities, but there's this undergirth of we're not really willing to be brave about the long-term impacts of drugs in our schooling and how it plays out in the classroom and how it plays out and how it will impact the long-term effect, the brain development of children. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, after this legislation, what are we gonna see by way of the capacity of children to think and to engage in, in rich thinking and in rich problem solving. We have rich problems to solve. So what's gonna be the long-term effects 10 years down the line? Are we gonna study cannabis and what the impact is? 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, how are we going to see this showing up now in our classrooms? And I would love to be able to have this conversation now. Let's not wait. Let's start this conversation now where we can actually have some conversations about what the impact is and how it's playing out in our classrooms because we know that we have families who are experiencing stress and who are experiencing trauma. And I know why you reach for it, but now let's talk about how do we help and what are the things that needs to be in place. So um, I thank you for allowing me to lean into this talk today. Um, it's a little bit different than what I normally have done for the Legacy Ed News, but like I said to you, I'm going somewhere with this conversation. So we've talked about the local parenthesis piece. We talked about teachers carrying guns in schools. We're looking now at this cannabis piece and this um, kind of silent narrative around recreational versus addict addiction in our community. And now on my next session, I want to talk to you in the next Legacy Ed News around the serial killer of the American dream. How do we, uh, why do you think these deep rooted issues exist and how do we begin to solve it? So that's where I'm going. I want to say to you, thank you again. If you're new to our community, welcome. Uh, please stay with me. Uh, this has been a journey for me. And um, I value the opportunity to connect with you as a community. I'm growing in, in it as well. So tell me some things if there's some topic around the news um, that you want me and around education that you want me to cover, put it in the chat and I will be happy to take a look at it and consider it as myself and my team as we plan out our legacy ed news. And um, if you haven't had a chance, I'm going to invite you again to our grandparents around the world ball this Friday, May 18th at Maestro's Catering in the Bronx. 
And you can get tickets at GATW.org, or you can email me or um, email uh, certainly the organization. And I get to be mistress of ceremony. I get to put on some pretty dresses, which I love to do. And most importantly, I get to love on my grandparents and those seniors who have been just holding us up. And so that is my, that gives me joy to, to give them love and to let them know how much they appreciate it. Once again, to my village and my community of warriors, let me say to you that saying thanks is not the same as giving thanks. And I give thanks for you. Until next time, family, continue.